Okay, why don't we actually uh, begin? Um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us for the uh, 2022 State of the College. Um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, it's a little ironic that, uh, you know, this is occurring uh, on uh, Groundhog Day. Um, I was really truly hoping that we would be able to do this as a in-person uh, event. And uh, lo and behold, I find myself sitting in the same chair as I was last year, um, perhaps even wearing the same blue suit. Um, but we have much to discuss. And in spite of a year in which a uh, long shadow was cast, uh, by uh, the COVID virus. Uh, we have really accomplished a great deal and we have a very bright future ahead. I actually don't wanna spend a lot of time on, uh, uh, on the virus itself, um, but I just wanted to give you a very quick uh, uh, update on where we are. And if you remember when we actually published the administration's priorities for the current uh, academic year, one of the key ones was to continue to protect the safety and well being of our staff, students, faculty, and, and patients. We are, in fact, doing that. Um, and what you see here is simply a quick overview of our booster profile. Certainly, the entire internal community uh, has become vaccinated, uh, and we're now in the process of trying to ensure that everybody gets their booster in a timely manner. And so what you really uh, see is that 76% or over three quarters of our community have now received their booster. Um, and actually of those who are actually eligible for the booster were at uh, over 85%. Um, the numbers are there for faculty, residents, students, and staff. Um, deadlines are, are approaching, um, but I'm actually really pleased to see uh, how well people have responded. And uh, I think uh, it's just a, uh, uh, a wonderful statement of the commitment of everybody within the community to ensuring everybody's safety and comfort. I'm not sure that there's much more that we could do um, as a community than we are already doing between the safety protocols that have been put into place and getting vaccinated. We also have the good news that when we look at the profile of New York City, um, although the number of cases really went up uh, you know, quite high, uh, they also came down quite rapidly. Um, I took a look, this is actually uh, data from today. And if you look at uh, yesterday's profile, it actually turns out that we're just about where we were the last time we had an event. And that was of course the recognition ceremony um, and the uh, uh, holiday reception, you know, and so, <clears throat> Um, as you know, you know, we're opening back up to events uh, starting February 14th, and I'm sort of expecting that we'll be able to relax uh, other restrictions uh, quite quickly, uh, or hopefully quite quickly uh, thereafter as well. Um, I always uh, have to, I was actually hoping never to have to use this slide after last year, but I brought it back. Um, and that's just to give a call out and a thank you to everybody who's been a part of the COVID uh, uh, ERT, Emergency Response Team. <clears throat> it's been a, a challenging year um, and everybody has gone above and beyond the, the call of duty. Uh, you know, and certainly uh, thank you to, to Chris Gomez and to Mike McGovern for sort of their leadership, particularly on the vaccination uh, process and helping to assure and answer everybody's questions. So with that, <clears throat> I actually wanna start on a brighter note. And that is it really hasn't been a bad year when we begin to look back. Um, we're in the middle of our 50th anniversary, and I think probably the right thing to do is to simply say thank you to whether uh, to everybody, whether they've been here for one year or whether you've been here for 50 years. Um, 50 years is quite a long time, uh, and this college has established itself as a leader in optometric education and vision research, and it's not possible without the contributions of everybody within the institution, no matter what role you play, it does uh, have an impact and a positive impact on the achievement of our mission. <clears throat> when I did a quick look at 2021, I was actually very surprised, yeah, I probably shouldn't have been, but quite surprised by some of the accomplishments. Um, I have to say, uh, as I did this, I actually left accreditation out. Um, and then I realized that we got affirmation of accreditation only six months ago. We spent two years getting there, um, but it's amazing how quickly time passes and how quickly 
um, memories are erased, you know, as, as you move on to new priorities and new agenda items. Um, but we've worked hard to expand our commitment to certainly diversity, equity, and inclusion. And of course, you know, we are continuing and kudos to uh, admissions uh, and the admissions committee. Um, we are still admitting highly qualified individuals. Um, even uh, with the solid base, we're also seeing new accomplishments. Um, Dr. Troilo, the faculty, the department chairs, um, the micro-credential program came to fruition with our first graduates, uh, 16 graduates completing the micro-credentials program uh, this past spring. Our ODMS program uh, a year ago admitted seven and just uh, last month admitted 11. Uh, these are the largest numbers since 2013. And so clearly there's greater uh, interest and enthusiasm for engaging uh, in the uh, research programs as well. Uh, residencies, largest class ever accepted. Um, notably, um, I think you can look at the numbers uh, uh, on research, nearly 14 million in cumulative grants. And in terms of the research expenditures projected for this year at four point, over 4.1 million, what I would share with you is that the business office has sort of affirmed that this is by far um, the most, uh, the highest level, uh, the highest level of activity in the history of the college. Um, and that's, uh, we also have a couple of uh, grants pending that received very good scores um, in their review and, and we're hopeful, uh, optimistic that those will get funded. And so our research program, in spite of the challenges, you know, whether it's basic translation or clinical research um, is thriving. Um, and, uh, you know, growth uh, appears to be uh, sort of not only here, but on the horizon as well. Certainly a challenging area, I think, has been in the University Eye Center. You know, kudos in that they've rebounded to nearly 90% of patient visits and 94% of revenues. Um, and that's, you know, even, uh, you know, being in Midtown right now where many workers have not returned um, since the onset of the pandemic. Um, tourism has been down. Uh, you know, and so I'm actually quite pleased at the progress that was made and how quickly uh, we came back. So the year has been good. So we're back, we're strong. Um, and I think it's a time to sort of reflect on not just where we are, but where we're going um, and what areas we're gonna be putting our focus on um, as we proceed into the next year and in the years ahead. If we start looking at the first, and that is, you know, for us to truly be successful, we have to restore our commitment to program excellence. Not restore it, but continue it. Um, education, research, patient care, that's the core of what we do. If those programs are not solid, if those programs are not excellent, our leadership position in optometric education and vision research is going to be um, uh, threatened. So if we just look, and, and you've seen these kinds of slides and these kinds of metrics, and I'm gonna go through them quickly, but you know, certainly our admissions process has been sustaining you know, the quantitative indicators. Um, if you look at the GPAs, uh, that little purple dotted line under SUNY is where we are this year. Um, last, the last, admitting, last class admitted, uh, again, we were in that top tier. Um, you know, with Ohio State, UC Berkeley, and so on, uh, in terms of uh, uh, optometric emissions test scores and total science. We still are a institution of choice. Um, we do see some degradation, you know, this past year going from 63% to 61. What this really means is that the students that we're, we're offering admissions to are accepting our offer of admissions. We want to be the ones deciding who are the best students and who do we want to be a part of our community. Um, it's hard to know how much the pandemic may have impacted um, the past couple of years in terms of those yields, um, but it's still fairly impressive. Um, and notably, I recast this data a little bit to look at it is how are we compared to the national average? And if you look at the national average for yield as simply that blue line across the middle, um, our selectivity, not our selectivity, but our yield is 17% higher than the average institution on a nationwide basis. So we're actually at our highest level of separation um, from that national average, um, at least in the history of maintaining this data. Students are actually still doing fairly well, particularly if you look at part one and part two of our national boards, very consistent this past Friday, 
we did actually get the uh, results from uh, part two for the class uh, of 2022 that took it in December um, with a 95% uh, first time pass rate. Um, the ultimate pass rate in terms of having passed all parts at national board, you'll kind of see has been a little bit rocky. Um, but again, you know, it's hard to know whether that's uh, something of a side effect of, of the uh, pandemic um, monitoring. And I know certainly uh, Dr. Troilo, Dr. Alvieri, um, faculty um, are, are working to make sure that our students have support so that they do pass these exams on the first time, first time through. Um, in terms of our programs, our formal programs, um, you can see that over the years, uh, yes, we increased our enrollment of the ODs, that's now stabilized, um, but we continue to give MSs, PhDs, there's the Advanced Graduate Certificate in Optometric Business Management, and this year uh, we added uh, the micro-credentials uh, as well, and of course residencies um, have continued to grow uh, over time. And in the research program, you know, I already pointed out and highlighted, um, you know, uh, that we're doing uh, incredibly well. Um, this data is actually from ASCO, um, you know, and this is total research awards. Uh, and so for the 2021 uh, fiscal year, um, we were at a little over 5.1 million in awards. That's different than what you expend. Um, but we're up there certainly right with Indiana, you know, and uh, Berkeley is right now in, in the first position, but we are uh, gaining ground. Dr. Bloomfield uh, provided these numbers um, or many of these numbers uh, in that top graph, um, but the cumulative budget for fiscal year 22, you can see we hold in terms of total or cumulative budget over the years of the awards, we hold almost $14 million in research awards. Um, that's up over 2 million from the prior year. Um, and as I mentioned, we actually have, um, you know, a couple of grants uh, pending, um, you know, which will have uh, a significant impact in uh, uh, assuming we get funded. And again, that 4.1 million in expenditures, over 30% increase from the year before, you know, and, uh, and growing. And so again, congratulations to everybody involved in research at the college. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, it was an extraordinary year and it looks like uh, the next year may be uh, just as uh, remarkable as well. <clears throat> Patient census at the UEC, you can actually see, um, this of course was the pandemic 2020 uh, in the orange line, uh, picking up over here in terms of the 2021 fiscal year, uh, where it grew back in around uh, October of 20, uh, uh, 2020, actually, uh, uh, it came back to being a bit closer, lower than the you know, pre-pandemic levels, but um, not far away. And sort of continued at that level and has continued and picked up uh, this year as well. Um, it's certainly my expectation and, and hope, you know, that as uh, we get past what we <laughs> keep hoping is the last wave um, you know, of COVID, uh, that as uh, people return to offices and workers and uh, employment picks up in, in the Midtown area, um, we will be back to and perhaps exceed pre-pandemic levels. Now, one of the things that often happens is we focus so much on the 42nd Street facility and the UEC, we often lose track of our impact in our network um, outside of uh, the college uh, campus itself. Um, I want to say thank you certainly to Dr. Richard Soden, our Director of Healthcare Development. Um, this year, uh, he, well, this year actually uh, was the fruition, I think, of many years of work, um, expanding our relationship with New York City Health and Hospitals. Health and Hospitals is the largest urban public healthcare system uh, in, the, in the country. Um, it offers a remarkable opportunity for our students and for the college to serve very diverse populations and underserved populations uh, throughout the city. Um, we had relationships with four of these sites, um, and this year we've added uh, four others um, to our contracts. Now, they don't have students in residence yet, um, but uh, faculty are beginning to be assigned uh, or hired uh, for those roles. And so we've actually sort of doubled that footprint. And I think the relationship with H&H &H, um, is incredibly promising in terms of uh, the future. 
But that's also just one step, you know, as we look outside, you know, if we simply look at the five boroughs um, of, of New York, we have six residency sites. There are 19 externship sites, 16 satellites, and satellites are those that we have financial contracts with as well as educational, and seven community partners. That's nearly 50 relationships, 50 sites um, just here in the five boroughs. And when we look beyond the five boroughs, you know, all told we have 99 sites, including uh, 68 externships, 12 residencies, you know, the 16 satellites and the community partners. Um, our footprint, our network um, is extensive. And I think we often lose track and perhaps underappreciate um, the importance of this network um, to the college, um, but also to our students and our residents um, as they become uh, educated and qualified uh, as optometrists. So I feel very confident, and I, and I hope everybody else does too, um, that the educational research and patient care programs of our college are solid, they are uh, excellent, you know, in terms of their quality, um, and that there is a strong foundation uh, for the future. Um, we do need to take care of them, we do need to protect them, and we do need to constantly evolve and change if we're going to maintain a leadership position. Which then brings me to some characteristics of, I think, a successful community. And that is a culture of innovation, always being able to plan, anticipate, and change but also flexibility and adaptability, which is not all forces are within our control and that we need to be able to respond and integrate and come out better than we were before. If we look at the concept of innovation, I don't think we're short of examples. Um, you know, these are a few and a lot of it, you know, one of the things that certainly characterizes SUNY or I hope characterizes SUNY is that we offer our students a lot of opportunities beyond the OD um, that can uh, help differentiate them as providers and as optometrists or as researchers um, in you know, offering them these value added opportunities. So uh, quite innovative are things such as the MS residency and the PhD residency, the graduate certificate, while we've had it for a few years, um, I don't believe there's anything like it in the country. Um, our T35 program, the micro-credentials, quite new, electives, residencies doing advanced competencies. And I guess the last, well, the last one, obviously, career development is co-curricular. Um, but again, it's trying to provide our students with access to the most contemporary um, learning opportunities uh, that help them evolve um, professionally and personally. And it says beyond the OD, it perhaps it should say before the OD, but, you know, C-STEP in the eye care camp that started last year, are good examples, I think, of, of innovation that helps uh, us bring in uh, highly qualified uh, and diverse uh, applicants to the institution. And then flexibility, adaptability. Well, you know, we've just been through two years of flexibility and adaptability. <laughs> um, you know, whether it's shifting to remote learning modules, the virtual admissions process, you know, certainly the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging efforts, mental health programs, all of these are things that are good and important. And some of it was very intentional internally, but some of it was also a result of external forces. And an institution and a community that is willing to listen and willing to see and willing to respond um, will be stronger and more successful in the long run. So yes, we're back, we're strong. Um, and the other element, and I've mentioned a couple of times, is a culture committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And obviously, this has been a central topic of conversation. But I also want to bring the community back and remember that, you know, much of our conversation is about the college, the college community, um, the degree to which uh, we embrace diversity, the degree to which people feel that they belong and are included in the community. But I also wanna remind everybody that part of this is also developing our students, developing our students as thoughtful, caring eye care providers who have the experience and who have the sensitivity um, and the cultural awareness to provide for everybody. 
um, no matter you know, what kind of a community they come from, what their background is, what their socioeconomic level is, what their race is, what their ethnicity is. And so in, in trying to ensure that our own internal community um, is one that embraces uh, DEI, um, we're actually, everybody is a teacher of everybody else. And we're actually preparing our students to be better professionals um, as a result. And certainly when you think a little bit about uh, the expansion of the relationship with health and hospitals and the communities that they serve, um, it's all quite complementary. And there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, articulation there in terms of goals and purpose. Now, I think everybody knows, you know, the diversity inclusion master plan was shared, um, you know, by Dr. Hareward and Dr. Alberry and requests for comments were due this past Friday. So uh, they're in the final phases of, I think, dotting the I's and, and uh, crossing the T's. Um, and that should be um, ready for broad uh, uh, review. And, well, not broad review, but uh, for final approval. Um, very shortly, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing the final final product. Um, and they have a mission, and they have a number of goals. And I would encourage everybody, if you didn't read it or you know didn't comment, you know, pick it up and read it. Um, there's a lot of information, and I just want to share a couple of points from it uh, related to the first goal, which is to increase the number of students and faculty from underrepresented minoritized communities. Um, the top uh, uh, graphic. Um, I derived from, from data that was really in there, and it really sort of looked at broad categories in our distribution. And without going through it in, you know, too finely, what you can really see is that when it comes to diversity, the faculty and the students, and we've known this for a while, and we're working on it, and we are making progress, um, particularly among the student body. Um, if you look at the bottom a uh, graph that is from the uh, uh, diversity and improve, uh, diversity and inclusion master plan. Um, and perhaps it's actually better represented in the next slide, which is looking at um, our ability to diversify our student body, um, to attract underrepresented minority students um, you know, to the college. And you can see there that it's been a steady uh, progress you know, not as rapidly as, as some may like, um, but I think again, uh, the efforts of student affairs and admissions um, and the faculty who have been involved, um, you know, are really uh, moving this forward. Um, the far right there is the year to date. You know, thank you to Dr. Alberto for, for giving me the latest data yesterday. Um, this is year to date. We're ahead of last year um, and it's uh, likely to grow. Um, and so what you can see there is simply the blue is the number of applications, uh, the number accepted, and the number uh, who have deposited uh, to come in, which is at 12 at, at this point. And so just in, in closing on the diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, I just wanna thank um, the committee members uh, who are uh, listed on this slide you know, by their assignments, but um, thanks so much for the time and energy you put in here. I know that it was really a, a effort, you know, particularly with the climate survey and data to analyze. Um, I know people spent a lot of time and were very thoughtful in their deliberations and, and thank you for your review and, and your recommendations. So of course, you know, um, having excellent programs, uh, you know, having a proper culture, having a diverse community um, still uh, requires uh, resources. And so for us to move into the future, it's important to have a strong financial foundation and it's important to uh, have the infrastructure to support it. Now, I'm actually gonna only share one slide financially this year um, because to some degree it gets to the bottom line and that's our fund balances or our reserves. And you can see that at the end of fiscal year 2021, um, this past June, uh, we had 19 million 102,000 plus in uh, reserves. That was quite a change and a flip from 2020 when we were hit with the, uh, 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 the pandemic um, where we basically plunged by $10 million um, in between the state holding back on support as well as losses of revenues from a variety of sources. Um, you know, we, we basically expended over half of our reserves um, maintaining operations. Um, good news is we bounced back, you know, between spending, you know, being careful with our spending 
as well as the state, you know, beginning to loosen or loosening up at that point, uh, you know, what uh, they had committed uh, to us over time. We actually ended fiscal year 2021 um, just about where we were pre-pandemic. And so, you know, while it's been a sacrifice and challenging, and I think a little, uh, uh, you know, anxiety producing, um, we actually are in, in good shape. And I've shared this slide before, you know, uh, we try to maintain, make sure we have a minimum. It's really a expectation of SUNY system um, that uh, campuses have at least 25% of their operating budget uh, in reserve um, in case of emergency. Um, we actually embrace a little, a little more conservative position, uh, caution, you know, with 33% and certainly Interestingly, the $10 million in, in FY20, um, we would not have had that if we were operating at the 25%, we would have been okay with that cautionary note. So um, this is an example of a true uh, unanticipated crisis and being in a position to navigate it successfully. <clears throat> this year, we are projecting that we were spending about a million dollars, um, more than we would take in, uh, knowing it would take some time to build back our revenues. Um, six months in, um, our reserves were 18 million, 825. Uh, the business office uh, basically is uh, projecting or suggesting that the original 18 million is probably a pretty good number. So we are on budget, we are on target. So we're financially strong. The next question is the infrastructure. And a couple of years ago, and I brought this up last year, but a couple of years ago, we did extensive uh, examination of the campus and what our capacity was. And the real question for the framework for the future project was, what's the best long-term strategy for us to ensure stability and optimal educational and research environment from which to prepare doctors of autonomy? And the real question was, you know, if we were to continue to thrive and grow, um, is the footprint, is the capacity of uh, 42nd Street um, the right place to be? The conclusion was that we are financially strong and that our campus can support an increase in existing programs, uh, degree programs, research, and patient care. Um, obviously, this takes continued resources for us to build, um, but you know uh, that uh, became a big part of our thinking you know, as we uh, began to think about 18, the 18th floor when uh, system administration uh, uh, left and moved over to 55th Street. Um, from a infrastructure standpoint, this has been a constant effort. And I think every college um, and university has to constantly update and upgrade um, in order to meet the needs of the time. You know, and certainly you can see going back the last, over the last 10 years, we've built the student center, we've built out research laboratories, our lecture halls and teaching spaces, the library, the new laboratories in the lower lobby level and the new pediatric clinic. Um, you know, those all together, uh, along with, uh, you know, the, some of the stuff we don't see um, like uh, uh, HVAC, um, we spent probably just about 60 million in the last decade making sure that this facility was prepared not only for today, but for the future. Um, and we need to continue that effort. Um, we have now, uh, we had originally hoped that some of these projects would occur uh, two years ago. Um, money was held up and, and we've been waiting patiently, but in uh, January, um, we finally got word that some of our key projects and what I think are transformational projects um, have now not only been approved, but provided with funding. And so um, the seventh floor, adult primary care floor, um, has been funded to the tune of $12.2 plus million dollars. Um, and that will be a complete gut renovation. Many of our faculty and the clinical administration and staff worked on this very diligently for quite some time, you know, only to be put into a patient uh, waiting mode. Um, but we are going to be good to go. That project will probably get uh, underway in just about a year. And so we have plenty of things to do pre to uh, prepare for that. Before that, um, we also got the funding for the Clinical Vision Research Center. And so the old teaching laboratories on 14, and you can sort of see them in their gutted uh, glory, 
um, up there on the right, um, you know, is basically funded to nearly two and a half million dollars. Um, hopefully that will be out to bid shortly. And the goal is to have this completed by the end of the calendar year. So by next December, um, hopefully the CVRC will be moving into new digs with expanded capacity, both in terms of research, testing and, and offices. So uh, congratulations to that group. Um, and um, uh, this I hope will uh, allow uh, the tremendous growth um, that we've seen in the CVRC um, to continue. So uh, to Dr. Fry and, and her staff and, and the faculty who are engaged, um, uh, well, you know, uh, congratulations and uh, enjoy your new digs. It won't be that much longer. I know you've been waiting patiently. We also have a, a proposal in the old biology, uh, biological and uh, anatomy uh, teaching labs up on 16. We've actually put in a proposal to a matching fund uh, project up in Albany. Um, for every dollar we contribute, um, system administration would contribute too. And so to renovate those laboratories and expand our translational research capabilities, um, you know, uh, would cost us about a little over $2 million. It would cost the college about 700,000, um, but we would get the balance um, from system. Not sure where that is, we're hopeful, but um, certainly uh, Dr. Troilo, um, Dr. Bloomfield um, have spent years, um, I think with a, a vision of, of research here uh, that has got a significant critical mass and spans uh, basic translational and clinical research. Um, this would be a, a key uh, domino in, in making that a reality, um, as is the new uh, CVRC. Um, and so, you know, when we think about the framework for the future and increasing our research capacity and providing for growth, um, thank them for, I, thanks to them for their leadership and to the research community that's worked on these things so hard. Um, but it's just wonderful to see um, this kind of progress uh, uh, finally coming, coming about. And so that brings me to strategic partnerships. One of the challenges of being a specialty institution or a specialized institution, um, sort of separated from other uh, university resources, um, is you can get isolated. And in an era when interprofessional care and interprofessional education, um, you know, is uh, really an integral part of developing truly successful healthcare professionals. Um, being a specialized institution does have a downside, um, you know, which is why having partners uh, becomes quite important. And in thinking about the expansion of our programming, um, we can do things ourselves or we can look to partners to do it. The most recent one in the press release just went out yesterday, although I think most of you are aware of, of it happening, um, you know, is the uh, agreement, uh, the partnership with Downstate Health Sciences University School of Public Health. Um, their dean, Kata Demisi, um, you know, is very enthusiastic about this. They are going to be occupying a part of the 18th floor, um, the south side suite, when you get off the elevators on the left. Um, and they will be actually bringing in uh, faculty both for educational purposes as well as research purposes um, and establishing an extension site on our campus. Um, I think this creates tremendous opportunities if we take advantage of it um, for our students, for our faculty, um, for developing actually a public health uh, research capacity, um, you know, looking at optometry as a critical profession in, in population health, healthcare equity and access. Um, so they will be uh, hopefully moving in uh, beginning of the summer or around July. Uh, their first program should be kicking off in August, um, and over the first year, there will be three master's programs uh, offered up, um, an MPH in healthcare administration, an MS in global health, and clinical epidemiology. Um, this can be good for certainly students, and we'll look at ways to, to uh, create more integration. Um, it can be good for our faculty who want to seek additional uh, credentials, but and perhaps maybe more importantly, want to get involved in public health research um, 
and uh, help uh, the college as it perhaps becomes a, a leader within the profession um, in looking at health policy issues. So that's quite exciting. Um, but it's important to realize that, you know, uh, all of these relationships, you know, we've today, I've sort of focused on some, you know, the expansion of health and hospitals. We have had a relationship, a very successful one with Stony Brook School of Social Welfare um, for several years now. Um, again, the School of Public Health, uh, Empire State with our graduate certificate in business management and MBA program. But if you really start to map out all of the relationships that we have and how dependent we are um, on those relationships is quite remarkable. It doesn't matter whether we talk about education, patient care, research and graduate studies, or even pre-optometry. Um, you know, our, uh, our impact, um, our effectiveness as a institution and as a specialized institution um, has been made richer and will become even more uh, 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 impactful um, because of the relationships we have. Um, it is, there's very specifics, you know, in certain areas of our programming. Um, we obviously have always had a relationship with SUNY system, but Optometric Center of New York, you know, our foundation, um, you know, has been instrumental in providing very much needed resources. Our community partners um, beyond what we have listed here, as well as some of our international collaborators, um, these relationships, I think, have been perhaps more critical in our success and will be more critical in our long-term success. Um, and I think we need to protect those, care for those, cultivate those, um, and uh, uh, enhance uh, their value to us and our value to them. So when I think about the precursors for success, and which is something you do, you know, uh, you know, when you're uh, celebrating uh, 50 years old. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, the future is bright. I think we have, and we can check, you know, put a check mark next to each of these items. Um, we are prepared. We have the foundation. We have the character. We have the talent. Um, and we can move forward with all due speed. Now, our strategic plan, you know, as I begin to wind down my comments, um, our strategic plan uh, is for 2018 to 2023. Uh, 2023 is right around the corner. You know, generally, um, we would begin to move into a new strategic planning cycle this fall. Um, but in retrospect, and because of a number of variables, I'm not sure that that's completely necessary. You know, because as I look at it, yes, we are back, and I very much put in here and emphasize, and we are tired, um, but we are strong. And I truly do believe that as a college and as a community, we are at an inflection point in our history. You know, through innovation and a commitment to excellence, um, our educational research and patient care programs can have a bigger impact on the advancement of eye and vision care than ever. Um, do we need to go into a new strategic planning cycle right now? Um, here I look at the end, we're tired. Um, I don't think so. Um, we have a very strong plan. We've actually made significant progress on that plan, but that plan still holds largely true. Since we put that plan together, We've done the framework for the future and really kind of looked at the facility infrastructure and capacity issues and the room for growth um, here on 42nd Street. We've encountered um, the uh, challenges um, and the barriers to progress uh, represented uh, by the COVID virus over a two year period of time. You know, our direction, you know, is now also uh, influenced more heavily um, by our renewed commitment, you know, to diversity inclusion and the diversity inclusion master plan um, needs to be looked at. Um, but um, I've made the decision that rather than go through a major planning process at this point, I think we can modify our strategic plan and extend it out to 2025. And so I will be asking the leadership and the institutional research uh, and planning committee to work on uh, modifying care lead in advance to extend its life by a couple of years, making modifications where necessary. 
Um, and we will be uh, sharing those proposed provisions, I hope within the next three to four months with the community at large to gain additional input. Um, and my hope is that certainly within six months at the latest, um, we will have a modified roadmap um, for the next several years. So with that, I wanna thank you. Um, it's uh, you know been an incredible year and we could not have done it without everybody um, pulling their uh, fair share. Um, we've often had uh, staffing challenges. We've had some financial challenges. We've had pandemic and COVID challenges. Um, but just thinking back to that earlier slide with what we accomplished in the past year, um, I think it's quite remarkable. Now, sadly, one of the side effects of the pandemic is we probably didn't really get to celebrate the 50th anniversary quite the way we really intended or wanted to um, over this past year. The 50th year is beginning to come to a close, but I do want to make sure that everybody knows um, we are giving it one more go and to mark your calendars for April 14th for the Eyes of New York. We are combining actually with the student's eyeball. Um, we're trying to make this as accessible and as big and loud a celebration as we possibly can. It's going to be at the Edison Ballroom uh, over on 47th near 8th or between 7th and 8th. Um, and um, I think a good time will be had by all. So I certainly invite you, more details will be forthcoming, um, you know, from Don and the Institutional Advancement Office. Um, they've done a fantastic job this past year, I think navigating the virtual world when we really couldn't do much of what we wanted to do. Um, you know, but this is a, a last shot chance um, for us to celebrate in person with one another. So thank you. Uh, 